Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for the Confronting Racism series. We're in week three of the week seven program, which is streaming live on Tuesdays at 8, 8 p.m. on Facebook. Um, tonight, we'll be talking about protests and social change. My name is Dina Okamoto. I'm the director of the Center for Research on Race and Ethnicity and Society. And I'm also a professor in the Department of Sociology here at Indiana University. So this series, it's a collaborative effort between Indiana University's Center for Research on Race and Ethnicity in Society, the Arts and Humanities Council, and the College Arts and Humanities Institute. And it's supported by the Office of the Vice Provost for Research and the Public Humanities Project. I want to give out a special thanks and recognize Ed Comentale, Michelle Moyd, Deb Cohen, as well as the ANH and the CREST staff for helping to put this program together tonight. Just briefly, this series was inspired by the nationwide protests against police violence and systemic racism and in support of Black lives. So we wanted to foster conversations about the histories and social realities of race, racism, and anti-Blackness in the US and explore the modes of protest, resistance, and rebellion used to confront these thorny issues. We know that racism is entrenched in our histories, institutions, policies and practices, and that it remains pervasive today. And we hope these, that this series can shed some light on one of the most urgent and important issues of our time. So over the next several weeks, we'll bring together experts in the arts, humanities, and social sciences to discuss how race and racism relate to a host of topics, including media and technology, indigenous perspectives, and global systems. And before I introduce tonight's program, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region. So we wanna recognize that Indiana University was built on indigenous homelands and recognize the Miami, the Delaware, the Potawatomi and the Shawnee people as past, present and future caretakers of this land. So I'll be moderating tonight's program on protests and social, social change along with Vanessa, uh, excuse me, along with Vanessa Cruz Nichols. So Vanessa Cruz Nichols is an assistant professor in the political science department here at Indiana University. And before that, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Research on Race and Ethnicity and Society here at IU. Dr. Cruz Nichols is an expert in political participation, public opinion, and Latino politics. Her work focuses on mobilizing messages and how to create a more engaged citizenry. So welcome, Dr. Cruz Nichols. Um, and before we turn to our panelists, I wanna just briefly define two topics that we'll be talking about today. Um, one is race and the other is protest. So just briefly, um, race has been one of the most powerful and persistent group boundaries in American history. Um, it distinguishes between the experiences of those classified as non-white from those classified as white with often significant consequences, devastating for some and uplifting for others. It's important to point out that race is not biological, but it's a concept and an ideology developed during the late 17th century alongside the establishment of African slavery as the dominant unfree labor regime in the Americas. So over time, as the idea of race evolved, white superiority took on the trappings of common sense, right? It just became widely accepted as a social ordering principle. Not only did it serve to justify slavery, but it also justified the extermination of indigenous peoples, the exclusion of Asian immigrants, and the seizure of Mexican lands. So racial practices uh, were institutionalized within US policies and the larger society. And as a result, race became an important mechanism for limiting and restricting access to privilege, power, and wealth. And thus, this created the racial inequalities that we see today. So I briefly wanted to find protest. Um, there are different ways that we can think about protest, but I think the traditional definition is one where a protest is something that's public, it's often collective, uh, it's a collective expression 
that seems, seeks to bring about social or political change. Protests can take many different forms, um, statements, petitions, uh, performances, and other public displays, uh, acts of civil disobedience, mass demonstrations as well. And people often engage in protest when institutions and those in power aren't responding to issues, problems, problems and grievances. Uh, we also note that engaging in protests can be transformative for those who participate. It can also be transformative for their larger society as such activity can shape public opinion, everyday behavior, knowledge, as well as policy. And protest opens up the possibilities for change. So again, we'll, talk, be, we'll be talking today about these issues, right? Race, uh, racism, protest, and change. Um, and I'll turn things over to Vanessa, who will start by introducing our first two panelists. Thanks, Tina. Um, great introduction, and I'm honored to be here. Um, so tonight I'm introducing first Dr. Stephanie Wessel. She's an assistant professor of history at Fordham University, and she is, has received her PhD in history from Indiana University, uh, recently completed a postdoctoral fellow position at Mount Holyoke College, um, her research focuses on revolution, community organizing, and immigrant activism. Dr. Hueso's current work examines how Salvadoran community organizers in both El Salvador and the diaspora have used popular education to create spaces of belonging when state systems and narratives have neglected to do so. She's recently published work about political actions of the National Temporary Protected Status Alliance as well, uh, which she will be speaking about today. So thank you, Dr. Hueso. Um, and we also have Dr. Matthew uh, J. Countryman. He's chair of the Department of Afro-American and African Studies at the University of Michigan, where he is an associate professor of Afro-American and African Studies, History, and American Culture. He is the author of Up South, Civil Rights and Black Power in Philadelphia, which won the 2006 Liberty Legacy Foundation Award for the best book in civil rights history from the Organization of American Historians. Dr. Matthew Countryman is currently working on a political history of African American mayors in the late 20th century, and he recently published an essay about the 2020 uprisings, which he describes as unprecedented in scope and part of a long river of struggle in America. So thank you, Dr. Countryman. Thank you, Vanessa and Dina. Um, for the introduction and thank you to everyone um, who made this series possible. It's been great listening um, the past two weeks about it and it's really a privilege um, to be here today to talk about these important issues on protests and social change. So my work focuses on community organizing in a transnational context, specifically within the Salvadoran community. I began my work trying to understand the diversity of resistance strategies during the Civil War and quickly realized that these experiences of resisting the status quo have influenced immigrant activism in the US. Whether it be teaching English based on day laborers' experiences, so teaching English to day laborers based on their experience, or lobbying for driver's licenses for immigrants in Maryland um, during the mid-2000s, mid Salvadorans have used a repertoire of tools based on their experience during the war to inform their activist work here in the US. One of the organizations that I have had a, a privilege of working with both as a researcher and a volunteer, the National TPS Alliance, has also been influenced uh, by the Salvadoran, and we can say more generally the Central American um, organizing experience. So the National TPS Alliance was created in 2017 after the Trump administration announced the end of the temporary protective status. This program was initially developed by the Bush senior administration through the Immigration Act of 1990 for Salvadorans who didn't qualify for asylum or refugee status, which was the majority because less than 3% of um, Salvadorans and, and Guatemalans uh, qualified for asylum. 
Um, later, it expanded to individuals from 13 countries who experienced civil unrest or natural disasters. TPS program provides holders um, to live and work legally in the US, but does not provide a pathway to citizenship. Can we go to the next slide? 30 years later, around 411,000 individuals have TPS from 10 different countries. Um, and as you can see, many of these, well, all of these um, countries are, are their, their status is soon to expire. So for the past three years, members of the National TPS Alliance have organized to demand permanent residency. Uh, next slide, please. They have marched in Washington several times. And for those uh, TPS, the TPS community and the allies who are watching now know that a lot of those times it has been pouring on us. Um, but we were there protesting several times in Washington, DC. And during that time, we pressured senators, Congress people, and local politicians to support the cause. They've also held local, regional, and national assemblies to inform the TPS community about updates on their political work, like the various lawsuits against Trump, which I'm, I'm happy to talk about later. Um, but they've also gotten together to create more local communities, uh, committees, and recruit and train leaders within the movement. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of their greatest tools have been caravanning, has been caravanning across the country. Their first caravan, what they called the Journey for Justice caravan, drove across 32 states, 70 cities in a matter of 12 weeks. Their bus, uh, which was beautifully painted um, and called La Libertad or Liberty, had some 50 TPS holders and allies um, inside the bus traveling across the country. They became known as justice writers and they would share their stories to denounce US structural oppression in their lives. Uh, next slide, please. The most recent caravan was just, I think, uh, what, into the, a week or two weeks ago. Um, and they shared the same message of permanent residency, but this time they had to adapt to the new reality we are facing because of COVID. Instead of getting back together, um, thousands of people in front of Washington, D.C., uh, TPS holders drove from Texas, California, New Jersey, Massachusetts, around the country. They drove hours to meet in D.C. to remind people that they are still fighting for permanent residency, that they have lived here for many years, contributed much, and that many of them are the essential workers that this country praises. There is an urgency in their message because if Trump is allowed to end TBS, they will be de deported as soon as January. And because of this urgency, they have made sure that their voices are heard in these large protests and uh, mobilizations. But they also acknowledge that these large scale protests and mass, mass mobilizations can't be it. In fact, protesting is, is the easy part. Um, while they provide visibility, what's more important is what happens the day after. For the TPS community, that looks like monthly local meetings, weekly phone calls, and everyday conversations that they have with their family, friends, coworkers, and even strangers about dismantling in their small way anti-immigrant, racist, and xenophobic rhetoric. It isn't about going one day and protesting and then returning to normalcy until they are encouraged again to protest. It's actually about demanding their place in their country, in this country, while creating their own spaces of belonging when the state refuses to do so. Um, I have more to say, but I think we can leave it there for now. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Hueso. Um, great to hear about your work and recent protests and caravans. Um, so next, we are going to be transitioning to Matthew, Dr. Matthew Countryman's presentation. I'd like to remind viewers that you can go ahead and submit questions and we'll try to field those at the end of the panel. Um, but Dr. Matthew Countryman, uh, we'd like you to you know, talk to us a little bit about how your work relates to um, this topic of protest and social change um, and broader forms of resistance. Uh, take it away. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, actually, if you could put the slides up, that would be great. Um, so I am a social movement historian, um, um, and I couldn't help but show off my <laughs> the cover of my book. Um, um, which is, uh, um, as, as Vanessa said, a study of the civil rights and black power movements in Philadelphia. Um, I, as a social movement historian, um, think a lot about, um, and particularly as, a, as, a, as an African American social movement historian, think a lot about the question, relationship of, um, uh, or the role of um, social movements in, in African American political history. Um, as um, kind of uh, the key device, the key set of political tactics that African Americans have used in the pursuit of freedom um, uh, and, and racial equality over um, over uh, the long history of of, um, of, the, of our presence in the United St in, in North America and, and in the United States. Um, questions that social movement historians ask. Um, are very much about when do social movements, uh, when and how do they impact um, uh, the American political process um, uh, and, and uh, um, American policy? Um, this is, you know, a particularly, I mean, a uh, crucial question in the civil rights movement history, um, in part um, because um, the emergence of the Southern civil rights movement in the 1950s really is a, is a kind of conundrum for American po political history, right? Here we have um, the beginning of the American century at the height of the Cold War, height of the U.S.'s emergence as the most powerful country in, in the world, and you have um, the, you know, least powerful people in society, um, disenfranchised, impoverished, um, um, at the mercy of really a, a, of a, a, not just a Jim Crow segregation, but, a, but the, the, the racist, violent, violent racism that, that underlay it, and yet capable and able to build a social movement that not only changes federal policy, right, on a whole range of uh, issues from, um, you know, public accommodation, segregation of public accommodations to um, employment law, um, eventually to banning discrimination in, in housing and voting rights, but also serves as a kind of springboard to a whole range of, um, of social movements, right, that, that emerged, the women's movement, um, uh, uh, other movements of, of, of racial minorities, um, the emergence of the gay and lesbian movements. All of these are built on, in many ways in the 1960s on the model of, of the civil rights movement. And the question that, 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 that I ask it, um, in my own work um, and looking at Philadelphia, but more broadly, right, is what are, what happens in the um, uh, political process, the formal political process, you know, the, the uh, of elections, of, um, of, 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 you know, of politicians, of formal policy making, uh, of the role of uh, all kinds of uh, legislative advocacy lobbyists, uh, both from the corporate business worlds, um, but also uh, citizen, citizens groups, how is it that forces outside that, that people who would lack much power within that formal political process are able to shape politics and policy? Um, and so that's the set of questions that I asked in the context of my work on, on Philadelphia, a world in which, um, unlike the South, right, where political, black political rights um, seemed to promise when there was laws to protect um, uh, racial minorities against discrimination, and yet, racial inequality persisted and to try to understand how, um, how that emerge, movement emerges in the city at that time. Um, and if you can go on to the next slide, but I want to bring, I also bring these questions to thinking about um, 
uh, other movements and other times. And I've been particularly thinking recently about um, not just the uprisings of the summer of the summer, but what led to them? What is the background? What are the origins um, uh, of um, of this thing that we that you know those of us who study movements could not have did not at least I didn't expect to happen, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, um, as horrifying and 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 um, infuriating as the murder of George Floyd was, it's not the first, right? We we've, we've had a series of these things. So why now? What makes a movement possible in this point? And here in my the essay I wrote recently, I drew on um, the groundbreaking uh, work of um, uh, 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 the African American historian uh, Vincent Harding, um, who is the author of There is a River, The Black Struggle for Freedom in America, uh, a history of um, uh, African American struggle uh, in the era of slavery. Um, Harding who was also a theologian, um, um, actually best known as a, a speechwriter for, for Dr. King, uh, drafted the initial draft of the speech that would become Beyond Vietnam, Dr. King's 1967 uh, speech declaring his opposition to the Vietnam War. But in, in, the, in, in the There is a River, um, Harding uses the metaphor of a river of struggle, uh, a river that at times is powerful um, and seems uh, you know, on the verge of over, overrunning its banks, and yet at other times seems to be um, almost without direction, right? It's so, it's so stayed, it's so quiet. Um, uh, how do we understand these kind of moments of, of, of uh, extraordinary power uh, of this river of movement in other points? Um, uh, there is not, uh, doesn't seem to be that kind of social movement activism. Um, and so I, I draw on Harding's work to think about how um, the um, summer of 2020 really is the coming together, the confluence of a set of movements, obviously most, most prominently Black Lives Matter, um, but the immigrants' rights and DACA movements we talked about, uh, the Occupy Wall Street, the uh, activism for climate change, the Me Too movement. I think, in fact, we will see, um, historians will come to see the period, the late second half of the uh, or second term of the Obama administration and the first term of the Trump administration is constituting one of these high watermarks uh, for social movement activism, a time in which both the political process seemed to be failing us. Um, uh, in which um, uh, we seem to unable, the, the political process, the formal legislative process in Washington seems unable to deliver the kinds of uh, policy responses, both to economic inequality, to climate change, to persistent racial uh, um, violence um, that, we, that, that you know, we all need. Um, and so people begin to look outside that formal process to begin to find motivation um, to, to, to take up these new kinds of strategies. Um, but also I think in the, in the, in the aftermath of um, the Great Recession, where right, we have a generation of young people um, who are prepared for real change in our society. Um, and, I, and I think, um, and that includes real fundamental changes in, in, in understandings of race, and I'll, I'll talk about that later, um, um, but also um, again, a real, real rethinking of the very fundamental principles of American society. Um, I'm a historian, I'm terrible making predictions. So, you know, this is a sort of prediction I'm making that this is not, the, not just a, uh, a kind of summer of, of, um, uh, um, of, of opposition, but something that's gonna be much longer and have much larger impact on, on, on our society. I'm, I'm, I'm just, if you could go to the last slide and then I'll just finish up quickly. Um, um, to say that I think there's also real two, that if in fact I'm right, that this is gonna go on, there are two real important challenges that um, the, social, the social movement that we're seeing at play now um, uh, has, uh, has to face. And one is the question of, cha of, of policy change. Um, and, and I thought and, um, in many ways, Stephanie's points um, play to this, right? Which is protest is one thing, but how do you translate that power, um, those people that support into uh, a ways of impacting the political movement. And how does that movement respond when it begins to engage a political process that is much more complicated than a mass march, right? Um, and so those are the kind of, we've already seen some real interesting developments on the policy front. 
a month after I, you know, after these things started. And, and I think it suggests a sophistication on the part of the movement, but it's obviously still very, very early. And the same question emerges around the relationship to electoral politics. Um, in my own work, uh, in my current research, um, one of the things I argue is that the emergence of a black politics, a black electoral politics in the 1970s, unintentionally, I would argue, in, in, in essence, eclipsed the social movements that had given birth to, the, to that politics. Um, it pushed it aside. Um, I, I see, again, in the Black Lives Matter movement and other movements, a different set of ideas about electoral politics, a, a, an ability to engage, but also a deep skepticism about whether um, you know, politicians in the political world can deliver on its own promises. So again, I think that's a really interesting question as we move forward um, uh, of how, how the movements um, and the Black Lives Matter movement and, and the related movements are gonna re relate to and engage with um, um, the formal political process. And I can stop there for now. Great, thanks so much, uh, Matthew. Um, already we're off to a, uh, a great start um, thinking about, again, how different pieces of research really can help us to think about the current moment, but also to think about, again, protest and social change. So what I want to do is I want to introduce um, our next two panelists. Um, and after I introduce each of them, we'll give them a chance to talk about how their work relates to protest and change. And so the first person I'd like to introduce is Crystal Chanel Truscott. She's an associate professor of performance studies and graduate acting at Northwestern University. She's a playwright, director, scholar, culture worker, and founder of Progress Theater, an ensemble company using theater as anti-racism, excuse me, as anti-racism engagement to encourage cross-community conversations, collaborations, and consciousness. As an artist, Dr. Truscott creates a cappella musicals using soul work, the gener generative method she developed from generations old African-American performance traditions for training artists, building performances, and connecting communities. She's currently working on a book which traces the development and practical application of soul work, pedagogy, for cultivating social power in creative expression. And our final panelist is Maisha Wester. She's an associate professor in American studies and an African and African-American diaspora studies at Indiana University. Her research focuses on black diasporic Gothic literature and racial discourses in US horror films. She's the author of African-American Gothic, Screams from Shadowed Places and Voodoo Queens and Zombie Lords, right? These are great titles, um, as well as numerous articles and essays. Dr. Wester is a Fulbright scholar, was a Fulbright scholar in the UK in 2017, where she studied Afro-British Gothic literature and the use of Gothic tropes in British discourses about race from the 18th century onward. Um, she was recently named as a 2020 global professor to the UK. So I want to turn um, to Dr. Truscott um, and ask her the same question about how her work relates to protest, resistance, and change. Thanks, Dina. I'll start with my work uh, as an artist and theater maker because that's the work I've been doing the longest. And really, since childhood, making art was my introduction to engaging, enacting, and understanding protest and its potential to drive transformation and change. Then hopefully I can circle back around to performance studies and culture change and other aspects of my work and their relationship to protest and resistance later in the conversation. The name of my company is Progress Theater. It's inspired and driven by a famous quote from Malcolm X in 1964, who responded to a question of whether progress was being made in the United States by saying, if you stick a knife nine inches into my back and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. The progress is healing the wound that the blow made, and they haven't even begun to pull out the knife, much less heal the wound. They won't even acknowledge that the knife is there. And that short quote for me 
were three revelatory steps for achieving progress, which I believe is the end goal of protest and resistance against systemic racism. So citing Malcolm, step one is acknowledgement. Acknowledge the knife. And acknowledgement is really a key factor in all protests. Throughout history, people have offered these definitive statements that proclaim, affirm, assert, um, and acknowledge our humanity, beauty, value, and full citizenship in a system that denies, that denies all of those things. Examples are Black is Beautiful, um, or I Am a Man, the picket signs from the Civil Rights Movement, um, to Black and Proud, and to, of course, now Black Lives Matter. And acknowledging that Black Lives Matter includes acknowledging that police violence is real and targeted to Black people. Step two. The next step, to go back to Malcolm's quote, is pulling out the knife, right? So ceasing the injustice, stop the hemorrhaging, and repeat cycles of oppression, abuse, and inequality. For example, ban chokeholds, right? Or from uh, the civil rights movement, end separate but equal. And then the third step, which is healing the wound, as Malcolm says, really manifesting change, new systems, um, ideological shifts, and culture change, culture change. So for example, defunding the police, right? Reallocating those funds to support the wellness of communities and nonviolent first responders, um, transforming the system that's in place to protect people because it's not working for all people. So all of my work with Progress Theater is really rooted in those intentions, promoting and contributing to acknowledgement, ceasing injustice and inequality, and contributing to transformation uh, towards a society and culture that privileges and standardizes equality and justice. To give an example, of how this artistically manifests for me. I'll talk a little bit about my current project in development, Plantation Remix. Um, at the heart of Plantation Remix is really the question of what is an appropriate and useful afterlife for these retired sites of oppression, right? Um, what's true is that if you trace the post-slavery journey of many plantations, their afterlife meant becoming prisons, um, one of the most famous being Angola Prison in Louisiana, a manifestation of what I call the um, plantation to prison pipeline as predecessor for the school to prison pipeline of our times. For other plantations, they exist now as wedding destinations, right? The word plantation used as an indicator for luxury or the implication of luxury that you don't have to work for. Um, or even master plan suburban communities, like a plethora of these examples of subdivisions um, throughout the South, but I'm sure not exclusively so, you know, Rolling Hills Plantation subdivision or Sunshine Plantation, you know, fill in the blank, any number of, of titles. There are some happier endings for um, plantations or afterlives, like Prairie View A&M University, a historically black college and university in Texas where my grandparents went to school and where I was formerly a faculty member, which was a former plantation. But we also know that that university is in Prairie View, Texas, which is the site of the death of Sandra Bland. So even in those happier afterlives, the blight of systemic racism is still present. All of this to say that in the US, um, the preservation of plantations has historically functioned very similarly to monuments that are now being called to be taken down. Historically, the vast majority of preserved plantations that participate in heritage tourism and landmarking, they offer a memorial or a memorialization of the sites, a nostalgic sense of sadness um, for what once was back then when America was great. Great. Um, that in effect revisits the violence, uh, trauma, and erasure of slavery. This happens through plantation tours that, for example, um, give a tour of the grounds, but make no mention of the native people and tribes that were killed and displaced to reappropriate the land for the system of slavery. And uh, plantation tours that, for example, give a two hour tour in delicate detail of the plantation mansion or the big house and make no mention of slavery or the people that also lived on that land whose enforced free labor was central to its existence and to the existence of the white antebellum lifestyle. So for me, the ultimate dream of Plantation Remix is literally to remix that whole process and journey, to rehabilitate this practice of heritage tourism by building collaborative stewardship of these spaces and the ways that our collective and public history and public memory are, are performed. Plantation Remix is not a historical reenactment. It is an acapella musical 
Um, that's what I write and that I, I create with Progress Theater. So it's an a cappella musical that provides a performative and participatory experience of touring those grounds. What does a tour look like if and when a multitude of American identities tells the story and gives the tour? So Native people, the descendants of people who survived enslavement, the descendants of slaveholding families, first and second and third generation Americans, recent immigrants and new citizens. How can we use performance to not only cultivate a greater understanding of the legacy of plantation systems, which in my opinion, we're all swimming in, no matter how we hyphenate and particularize our Americanness, but how can we use performance to build that understanding and the impact that those legacies have on us today? But even more so for me, my favorite part of Plantation Remix and the bulk of the piece really is a reimagining and a performing of how an appropriate afterlife of those spaces looks that is healing centered, future focused, solutions driven and inspired by equality. So it's not a, a reenactment because that work is already being done. Um, the Slave Dwelling Project in South Carolina has been doing amazing work to change the narrative for years. The Whitney Plantation in Louisiana since its opening has focused on the lives of people that were enslaved there. There are other sites, including presidential plantations like Monticello and Montpelier in Virginia and the Memorial to the Enslaved at Independence Mall in Philadelphia, which have begun in recent years to tell a more complete story of those sites and all of the people who live there. So that's why I stress that Plantation Remix is not a reenactment. It's a performative intervention and dream for the future. It's aspirational where a lot of the kindred work um, that I've mentioned is focused on the present and the past, Plantation Remix actively focuses on the future. It's designed for Progress Theater to be built and performed with local communities and to really provide a space to practice, right? To literally rehearse the society we want to be and to practice telling the story of this country together and building the a future that is multi-voiced and optimally inclusive with theater and music. And I, I can't wait to share it um, in partnership with these brave sites that are ready for transformation once it's safe for people to gather these kinds of events after the pandemic. So that's an introduction to um, some of my artistic work and I'll chime in later in the conversation with performance studies and other culture change work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. Um, I can't wait to hear more um, about the performative interventions, right, thinking about um, imagining a new future, um, super exciting work. Um, so now we'll turn to Maisha Wester and she'll talk about her work and how, again, it relates to protests and change. Thanks, Maisha. Uh, first, let me just say how much I'm enjoying the presentation so far. Um, I can't wait for the conversation that's to follow. Um, so briefly, my work considers the reciprocal relationship between anti-Black discourses and social political exchanges and racial representations in Gothic literature and horror film. To put it simply, I explore how our ideas of race are essentially popular income generating fictions. Now tonight, I wanna to tell you a story to show you how this works. And if you'll start the slideshow, please. For this story, I want you to imagine yourself as a average, white middle-class American. It's 1915 and you've managed to get tickets to the newest film. Well, films are rare back then, so a amazing marvel of technological advancement. It's called Birth of a Nation. And it's supposed to be a drama, but you and your fellow moviegoers watch many of the scenes in horror. You shudder in terror as Negro soldiers push white families off the sidewalk threatening to assault them. You gasp in disbelief as Negroes take over Congress, turning it into a scene of chaos and disorder. A couple of years later, you find yourself reading about white men assaulting Negro soldiers among many, old, many others in uniform as they're looking for a supposed rapist. You hear and read of cities around the US erupting and riots, but you don't really begin to feel anxiety until you read about how the Negroes are resisting, how they've taken up arms in locations like Washington, D.C. and in Chicago in self-defense. And you gasp again 
when you read newspaper reports stating that Negroes plan to kill all whites. You flash back to Birth of a Nation. So when you get to Tulsa in 1921, you breathe a sigh of relief when you hear that Black Wall Street has been burned down because like in Birth of a Nation, the whites have driven out the destructive usurpers and all can rest easy. I want you to fast forward about a decade. It's the 1930s. And you overhear a conversation about a new film called King Kong. And you wonder to yourself, is this movie really about an ape? So much of the conversation sounds like reports you've read about Negro rapists, murderers, criminals of all sorts. Surely this movie isn't about just an ape. Let's fast forward again to the end of World War II. You're reading reports of Negro unrest, but now commentators say that surely the Negroes aren't doing this of their own volition. Indeed, folks like Senator McCarthy say that there's an unseen red puppeteer evilly manipulating the Negroes from behind the stage, that these communists seek to infiltrate the U.S. in order to destroy society, to contaminate, as it were, white Americans and trick them into feeling sympathy for the Negroes. Leaders like Martin Luther King are deemed communist agents, while others like Malcolm X are deemed Frankenstein-like in their undirected, seemingly undirected rage. And as you watch, avid horror film that you, avid horror film fan that you are, as you watch the films of the 1950s and 60s, you notice that they tend to feature a lot of zombie or zombie-like creatures. And often these films are also located in jungle-like regions. And indeed, at the end of the 50s, a turn into the 60s, you get to see The Last Man on Earth starring Vincent Price. And indeed, you then, having seen this fabulous film, decide to go read Richard Matheson's novella from which the film stems, I Am Legend. And you're particularly struck by certain scenes in that novel. And indeed, one speech in particular about vampires' rights really rings a bell with you. Quote, why then this unkind prejudice, this thoughtless bias? Why cannot the vampire live where he chooses? Why must he seek out hiding places where none can find him out? Why do you wish to destroy him? Ah, see, you have turned the poor guileless innocent into a haunted animal. He has no means of support, no measures for proper education. He has not the voting franchise. No wonder he is compelled to seek out a predatory nocturnal existence. Robert Neville grunted a surly grunt. Sure, sure, he thought but would you let your sister marry one, end quote. And it goes on and on like this for decades. But let's jump ahead, let's fast forward, if you would, to the turn of the millennium. In watching movies like Candyman and the weirdly titled Leprechaun in the Hood, you recall Reagan's warnings about the inner city, a place populated by welfare queens, criminals, and addicts a wasteland where the denizens are unrestrained in their violence, even against each other. Now, admittedly, some of these films actually seem kind of progressive. For instance, Candyman does start with a nod to the history of black oppression, right? Now, fortunately, by the turn of the millennia, more black directors and filmmakers began to tell their side of the story. And new technology makes it possible for black pedestrians to film very real horror. In these videos, blacks refute ideas of monstrosity to scream the horror of racial subjugation. These videos time and time again illustrate Toni Morrison's idea in her, one of her many seminal works, Playing in the Dark. The notion that the lashes dealt the slave are not mandated by the slave's actions but by the master's desire. And as an avid horror fan, this new era should offer you 
a true horror fan's dream, a chance to see new, true to life horror stories. The question is though, can you see them? Will you learn new ways to watch and read? Or is sticking with Griffith scripts too easy to resist? Are you gonna be stuck rewatching Birth of a Nation for the rest of your day? I'll stop there for tonight. Thanks so much, Maisha. Um, we're actually gonna turn it over to Vanessa, who's gonna ask um, the panel um, the next set of questions. Yeah. Um, so that was really fascinating and I cannot wait to hear more. Um, I hope that we continue to chat um, well beyond this, this streaming time. Um, so something that I wanted to kind of say at, before we transition to the next question, I love how each of you from all of your different perspectives um, and all of your different experiences and training um, have brought up a tension between um, what um, people of color, like what people, um, those who are protesting in these examples, for example, are uh, how they're being deemed as either threatening or uh, people to fear. And in some way, all of you have kind of addressed the tension in divisions in public opinion, right? How other people are, are responding to the narratives that protesters or activists are trying to lay stake to. Um, and I think it's, it's really cool how you make me think about this as a way in which um, these activists and protesters are rising to the occasion to reclaim their time and to uh, reclaim their narrative and story um, and how they want it to be told. And so with that in mind about that tension and divisions in public opinion, and how some are telling one version of their experience and others are responding, um, you know, I'm curious about how protests and other forms of resistance lead to social change. What can protest, uh, protests accomplish and where do they fall short? So mainly that second part, right? So what can protests accomplish and where do they fall short given these tensions that you've brought up, right? Um, well, I'll start the discussion. Um, really, the best example of this I can think is actually uh, was something talked about in a podcast I love to listen to called Hidden Brain. And it was an episode on, I believe, um, the, called The Problem of Outrage. Um, and what that episode really talked about was how the way we currently express outrage tends to prove ineffective because we tend to rely on social media rather than getting out into the streets and interacting with each other. And so for me, protest really brings change because it refuses to allow people to exist within an echo chamber, be it protests mm -hmm. expressed on the streets, uh, via poetry and art, um, or via film, via, via um, uh, literary expression, right? Um, but it's important to force people outside of that echo chamber, to force them to consider alternative narratives to the ones that they're comfortable with and self-select into via most of our social media apps. That's powerful, Maisha. That's amazing. Um, to get out of those echo chambers, uh, that's a huge challenge for my students. I teach media and politics. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on that? On just, you know, how, act how activism and protests can accomplish um, a lot, but also where do they fall short? Well, um, from what I've seen, both during this moment and also back in, uh, you know, in the 1990s when TPS first emerged, it was, it, 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 it's demanding, right? Pressuring um, both local and state um, government and representatives and our, you know, our, our politicians to do something. But it's not only them, right? It's also the, the people that you interact with, um, helping them see a different, uh, a different narrative, what, right, than, than what uh, media tells you. Um, so, you know, in the case of uh, Salvadorian TPS, which um, is the largest uh, TPS community, uh, 200,000 um, Salvadorans are, or within the TPS community are, are Salvadorans, 
um, it is, and yeah, it is. And again, that's temporary protected oh, yes. status. Temporary, right, temporary protective status. Um, they, along with Haiti, who was also uh, part of the TPS community and uh, in a couple of other countries, you know, were recently called shithole countries. I don't know if I can say that, actually. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> um, by, by Trump not too long ago, right? And it was. Why? Well, because in, in the, for the Salvadoran context, at least, oh, they're gangs. They're bringing in gangs, right? MS-13 is this crazy gang that is killing everyone. It's criminalizing that community, right? And, and the, the right. Latinx community uh, generally. And what the TPS um, movement is doing is trying to change that narrative um, mm -hmm. through these, you know, lobbying mm -hmm. caravans. And, and really it's for people to know. Um, the fact that you had to define TPS again, right? Um, it means that not many people know about the temporary protective status and, and that movement. Um, so I think it's really about you know demanding and pressuring. But um, as I as I alluded to at the beginning um, in my presentation, um, one of the shortfalls is that it's it usually can only be one day, right? You go out. Uh, we can think about the mega marches of 2006, right? Uh, thousands and thousands of people came to protest against uh, an anti-immigrant bill. Um, but then what? Um, usually after protests, you go home and that's it. But it's different um, for those who are living it, right? For those who are, um, who have to consider and, and think what happens if uh, the Trump administration ends TBS. What will happen to me? What will happen to my family, to my US citizen children, for example? And so, I think one of the things, and, and, and it also leads to what Maisha said, right, about social media. We get wrapped up like, oh, uh, we click like on something and we have, we are activists. We are, we have protested. And yes, to a certain extent that is important, but it's also important to do that daily work. And so I think that um, it, it's great to go out and march and, and, and protest for a day, but it, it needs, it needs a follow-up, right? The day after, what happens the day after? That's what's important. I have a, a bit of a winding thought process in response to this, um, this question. Speaking as a performance studies scholar who studies performance not only as the object of analysis, but also as an analytical lens and a theoretical tool, a research method for understanding <laughs> social and cultural phenomena. So, when I say performance, I mean performance in the broadest possible sense, right? From those things that might most immediately come to mind with artistic performance, like theater, dance, film, uh, music, visual art, to broader frames like cultural performance and performances of identity and relevant to our conversation today, performances of protest. For me, I, I think of protest as broadly as I think of performance. Um, there are an infinite number of ways to enact protest and resistance from the things that we commit to doing every day in our behaviors, um, our interactions, to pivotal collective moments, you know, large scale moments that we'll never forget. And I'm thinking about three sort of general categories that I put protest in. So one being the event of protest, right, which is these large gatherings to articulate, to march, to sit in, to stand in, lay in. Um, uh, to the event of, pro of protest, that's a smaller moment, like seizing a moment in real time to stand up to an injustice that's unfolding in front of you, right? And we're seeing a lot of that today with people protesting and standing up to injustice by recording these everyday acts of white violence, like the incident mm -hmm. with Amy Cooper in Central Park. Um, that's, an, that's an event of protest as well, as well as the large scale going out and going to the street protest. And then I think about expressions of protest, right? What are the ways that we amplify our calls for justice, music, um, protest chants, the myriad of artists creating work to capture and respond to this moment, right? So the Black Lives Matter street murals that have been painted in DC and New York to people adorning their face masks with messages um, every day as they walk through the world or wearing t-shirts, et cetera. And then this other element of protest or category as I think of it is the practice of protest, which for me, um, and I think for many people is the persistent lifelong investment 
um, in, in, that understands the end goal of protest as change. So therefore, protest becomes the practice of making change. It becomes doing the everyday work to implement something new. Right, so not only about stopping something from happening, but manifesting the reality um, that we want to be and that we want to exist in. So for me, protest looks a lot of ways and does a lot of things. I'm not sure that I can say with that um, framework that protest falls short. I mean, what I can say is that protest is doing a lot of things. There's a lot of work going on and people are contributing in various ways. And we're protesting in a society where it's not unobstructed or uncontested, you know? So um, there's no, you know, like this, the, the system is, is multifaceted and so is protest and there's a lot of work that's happening. And then I'll, I'll just give two examples of, of, um, of, of how, how else I'm thinking about this question. So, you know, one is that I, I do think that protests um, in any shape, really, in any manifestation that I mentioned above, really shapes the lives of its participants. And that performance and creativity are essential here, not just for artists, but for everyone. A few years ago, I was visiting the National Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta. And there was a part of the civil rights exhibit is a pamphlet um, that was handed out to protesters during the civil rights movement of instructions. And some of them are like really practical instructions, like, like what to do if you get arrested, don't get arrested alone, and how to, you know, uh, shape your bodies to, to take a blow, right? Um, but then there was this one instruction that, from, this is a 1963 pamphlet, that lists singing amongst its other instructions, right, with regards to like dressing for safety and dignity and all of these types of things. So it says, quote, singing, Creating unity, easing fear, establishing moral superiority, forcing attackers to deal with demonstrators as a group rather than focus on an individual, communicating a political message, setting a unified rhythm for pickets and, march and marches, performance singing versus protest singing. In protest singing, everybody sings, no exceptions. If you can't sing, sing louder. And so I really, I mean, this is one of my favorite quotes and it's really a, um, a large part and at the heart of the work that I do with Soul Work and Progress Theater and my scholarship, which is this idea of, of singing. Like that's probably one of the most robust revolutionary definitions of singing I've ever heard, right? That it's not a tool for protest, but it's the protest itself, right? It's actually the thing driving the action. And for me, when people participate in experiences like that, um, that is, it becomes an opportunity for them to kind of rehearse the, the, the activist um, or the, the anti-racist person that they want to be. Like that builds the confidence and those large scale moments to have those small singular moments. Also, you know, to, to really be able to stand up and speak out um, and stand up to the, the courage of your conviction, right? And particularly in Black cultural tradi traditions and freedom, freedom seeking work, um, the arts have just always been essential um, as the protest and the change itself. So the, the act of protest gets pe gives people the opportunity to rehearse these convictions and behavior. Like maybe people have never spoken up before. Maybe they've never sang before, right? But that it can also be the catalyst that leads to this long standing <laughs> practice of protest and ultimately leading to how people, a change in how people move to the world. And then really quickly, uh, last thought is, is this idea of, um, Thinking about how our everyday experiences and the images and the arts and the propaganda we consume impact the way that we understand ourselves, each other, and society. I have been reading recently and really inspired and fascinated by a report by Color of Change, the organization Color of Change, that um, is analyzing the impact of scripted dramas on TV. I find the report really important. It's called Normalizing Injustice as Social Practice and Cultural Norm, and really looks at like what happens when the images and stories that we consume do not represent the reality, right? Although they, like the world that they exist is under the pretense of our reality, so it looks like our world, it's supposed to feel like our world. Um, it's not a work of like science fiction or fantasy or farce, but it's this world where racism doesn't exist, right? In, um, in the way that policing happens. It's, it's a world where the narrative is promoted that good guys, right, the cops sometimes have to break the rules in the name of justice. Um, and they have to break the rules for justice and to, and to do what's right. So the, the report goes on into much more than I'll talk about here, but really talks about how what we consume influences 
public thinking and behavior um, and, and miseducates um, the public. And so I bring it up to say, it miseducates the, pub, the public and opinion in ways that undermine reform, right? And transformation mm -hmm. towards equality. I bring it up to say that if we embrace this notion that what we consume and what we engage in artistically and culturally um, can be a force for normalizing injustice, that it has an impact, that the same can be true for art and experiences and culture that we consume that normalize justice and equality, that those things also have a behavioral impact that leads to social impact, that leads to changes in thinking and behavior, which ultimately leads to policy change, in my opinion. So um, I think all of the above apply. So can I build on that? Because <laughs> I think that's yeah. really a, a wonderful uh, way of thinking about um, moments, particularly when protest movements um, are impactful, when they um, when they change the narrative, when they when they manage to right. um, to to surprise us, and I and I and I, I think it's that element of of mm -hmm. of re um, reconfiguring what we think is about to happen that's really really crucial about at least particularly some of the recent protests. And I, one of the things I think about a lot is similarities in some ways. So I see between those initial weeks in Ferguson. Uh, mm -hmm. Back in 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 twenty fourteen, right, um, and and the and the and you know the last month, and particularly again the initial weeks after after the murder of George Floyd, um, because in both those places there was a script, mm -hmm. that, particularly that the police were acting on that they expected mm -hmm. to work, um, and I it's a script I think I mean I think both uh, Maisha's work has reminded us of its very oldness of that script. Um, but in my particular work, it's a script I see directly linked to the to the Black Power movement, to the ways in which um, um, police forces, the FBI, and others were able to link Black radicalism to notions of street crime, right, uh, and to the crisis of street crime, and that that plays itself out right through stop and frisk and through all of these elements of mass incarceration. And what we see in those initial days is the police reacting as if this is just about street crime. This is just about, and the ways in which protesters both refuse to be intimidated by that militarized police response, but then also flip, shift the narrative away from, I mean, this was particularly powerful right after Minneapolis because the initial days of, of arson and looting created a whole, a whole narrative, um, which, you know, in which I think we all knew where it was going, right? And even and whether or not you're sympathetic to the reasons why the looting and, and, and arson took place, we've all seen this before. And to have protesters stand up to that police intimidation, but, all, but do it in a way that changed the conversation back to the violence of the police, the violence of the state, um, through their protest tactics, was, I think, this particularly extraordinary moment. And not just in Minneapolis, in New York City, and in, in, in Atlanta, everywhere, right? Where the just the ability to put your body on the line, right? To come at, um, to to say, yes, I know I'm supposed to be afraid and go away, and I won't be afraid. I will not go away. Um, mm -hmm. And that, I mean, it, rem it reminds me of the undocumented standing up and saying, "I'm not going to hide in the basement. I right. I'm undocumented." Right? There's a there's a whole series of analogies we can draw to in the last. Oh, yeah five or six years of protest where people who were supposed to be afraid and go away and hide stood up and said, we won't be afraid anymore. And that's contagious, right? So that we saw that, right, in, in with often with majority white protester groups in, in places like New York City saying, we will not be afraid and we're going to call out this police violence. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the way in which movements build right, and learn from them, learn from their experiences and learn how to change that narrative. Now, let's be clear, the birth of the nation narratives, the street crime narratives, those narratives aren't going anywhere. They're there. Um, and any day, you know, and this is what I think I think about social movements, they're very fragile. You know, and the forces that would oppose them can also flip the script, right? right. <laughs> they have that capacity too. But what's interesting is the ways in which um, that, that um, um, what's extraordinary is the ways in which repeatedly over the past five to six years, social movements have managed to to 
take control of the narrative and break it from the expectation, right? So it's not, not that script on the TV show or the horror film that we know is all going to, they made it a different script, right? Right, um, right. And I, my last, so there's a funny thing I learned, something I learned not as a scholar, but as an activist in a training about what tactics or what protest is, right? The protest is the thing that people do to put pressure on, the, on those who have the power to give you what you need or what you want. Um, and the thing about tactics that work is that they're in the comfort zone of the protesters and they are uncomfortable to people in power. Um, and that's, to me, that fits that element of the surprise, the unexpected turn, right? If the media, if the people in power expect you to do a vigil and stand outside with your candle and not move, and, right, they'll just ignore you. It's when protest movements do the unexpected but in a way that brings people into them because people love to do that, right? And, you know, and again, the moment of COVID, none of us, all of us are staring at the ground. Where are these people coming from? Why are they willing to do this? What does that mean? And it's that, un, that, that unexpected move, that unexpected commitment, dedication, and the breadth of it that really does just remake the whole landscape of the political conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's right. And I think, you know, borrowing from some of the work that you all have already shared, but also just thinking about um, sort of at the, what's at the tip of my tongue is that these protests signal um, issue salience and issue intel, like a, a strong issue preference, right? And that people are, are agitated, they're upset, but they're also hopeful for this new imagined future, right? This new potential uh, of reform and change. And so there's work by, by my, some of my friends, Legina Goss that's looking at this, um, my friend Davin Phoenix in The Anger Gap um, about the importance of this hope to trigger this uh, reimagination. Um, and I love that you brought up the immigrant struggle as well. So we can, we can bring that up later. Great. Thank you everybody for your comments. Um, we're gonna turn now um, actually, if you have questions for each other, please kind of jump in. Um, I'm going to look through. So we have some questions from the Facebook feed. It looks like they're kind of directed towards individuals. Um, so I'm just going to start with one and then we can see where we go in terms of that. But this is directed at um, Dr. Wester. And the question is, um, could you please say something more about the concept of race as an income generating fiction? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's the question. So, um, on the one hand, I'm thinking here of um, both of Morris's idea of American Africanism in which she argues that blacks have a very particular function within the American cultural landscape. Um, but I'm also thinking about Richard Wright's fairly famous quote, right? That if um, he did not exist, um, he would have had to, horror would have had to invent him, right? There's some reason why uh, artists such as these, scholars such as these, um, are really arguing that Blacks cannot be seen um, as complex individuals, that we have to have a very centralized idea of race. It has nothing to do with actual Blackness itself, but rather with a way to abject um, onto black bodies, all that is disdained about whiteness, right? Um, so for instance, if you think about, for instance, the anxiety, the crazy anxiety during Jim Crow era about black rapists. Well, historically, if you think about the hundreds of years of slavery, how many white mistresses were raped by the black slaves, right? Um, mind you, quite often they were always outnumbered in profound proportions, um, but also it wasn't unusual for a master to leave his wife at home with these supposedly in, in Jim Crow era murderous hypersexual slaves, right? Um, but what you're really seeing in those moments, and Ida B. Wells calls this out wonderfully um, in a, a red record, right? That really what's happening is a projection onto the black body, which then allows whiteness to imagine itself as purified, as the hero, as the savior, right? Um, and then to further see whatever latent problematic desires that is being denied, punished, exiled to the margin, right? But in doing so, you also 
doomed a huge segment of the population to a lower level. You ostracize them from ranks of authority, from positions of power. Again, think about Birth of a Nation. Uh, and again, uh, if you haven't seen it, I'm not saying go watch it. It's a heinous movie. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the scene in the Congress, in the Senate, is really interesting because it's a terror <laughs> over what would happen if Blacks access any degree of authority and legislative power. Now, there were 10 years after the Civil War when Blacks did actually occupy political offices and no craziness happened, right? So we know this is a historical inaccuracy. The question is, why then do we have to insist upon this myth <clears throat> of Black monstrosity unless it's meant to function both culturally in terms of cultural psychology, but also in terms of Econ reducing people to a very specific economic position and allowing mm -hmm. exceptions to make their way out and marking how those exceptions are non-normative in their blackness. And so that's mm -hmm. what I mean when I say is an income generating fiction. The other thing is, if we think about, and I put this in terms of horror, um, but really I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that this is limited to horror. We see this, um, as Crystal said, all across fiction film, television, right? It's a common script. And so to take that script away, well, you take away a level of comfort. You lose readers, you lose audiences. Easier to go back to the script. The best example I can give of this, this is a movie I feel a bit ambivalent about. I kind of like it, but it, again, plays in some of the stereotypes. Um, you saw clips of it from in the last slide. Uh, you saw this in the first purge, right? which on the mm -hmm. one hand is really savvy and mm -hmm. sadly predictive where we seem to be going, <laughs> but mm -hmm. really savvy in terms of de defining the ways in which minority populations have time and time again been singled out as so much waste, so much trash, mm -hmm. the population to exercise and take out all your aggression against because, well, they're lesser, they're already criminal, right? The film is really critical of that. And yet the hero of that film is still one of those highly stereotyped, recognize, recognizable figures. He's the drug dealer that turns out to have a heart of gold, right? Um, and so you see this man at the beginning behaving in very st stereotypical ways, saying, well, you know, we got to watch out for each other because you, if we get sick, if we get hurt, you're messing with my money. This man becomes the savior of a Black community. Right. Um, and many audiences love that film. In fact, it was higher rated um, among general audiences than Get Out because it returned to that stereotype. Right. So that's what I mean um, in terms of thinking about the ways in which race is really an income generating fiction. Right. Um, and it's a fiction we've relied upon for such a long period um, that it really takes brave innovators to resist returning to. Thanks, Maisha. I'll turn it over to Vanessa. Um, if you wanted to go to the Facebook feed, Vanessa, or if you wanted just to yeah. ask a general question. Um, well, I guess I have a general question uh, before we go into the Facebook feed. Um, so, in part, I guess uh, I'm coming from a place of information, right? And how people process information. And, and a lot of that is very much ingrained in the storytelling component, right? But um, there's work that whether my, some of my colleagues have, have uh, recently written about in uh, The Monkey Cage and Washington, in The Washington Post. Um, uh, so I'm looking at Hakeem Jefferson, Fabian Neuner, um, and Josh Pasek from the University of Michigan initially, that group. Um, where they find that there's a racial divide, right, in terms of, uh, you, you could be seeing the same information, the same exact protest image, the same exact footage, right, but have very different narratives about what is happening there and who is at fault, right, and who's culpable. And so some of what came up in what you all were sharing right now, I just kept thinking about the dehumanization um, component of framing um, minority protesters in a negative light, right, and, um, and the struggle of people of color, whether it's in the immigrant rights movement um, or when we're talking about racial justice with regard to uh, Black Lives Matter. 
Um, so they find that, you know, it's not a matter of, of information or an echo, a different echo chamber. It's that they have different experiences with the police like in the police institution, right? And so they're going to attribute blame and, and question of, of culpability differently, right? And it's also, they find a difference in terms of who more intense, who has a stronger racial identity attachment, right? So if you have a more, more strong racial attachment, right, you wanna see your group more favorably. Um, and, and so you wanna see if you're a white, you know, um, viewer, you wanna see, you know, the sort of the white uh, protagonists painted in a more positive light. And if you're a black viewer, you wanna see um, the black protagonist in the script, right? portrayed in a positive, more positive light. But it's only among those who have a more intense or strong identification, right, with their group. So not all, it's not homogenous. Um, but yeah, so I just am curious about what you all think about, you know, just the fact that, you know, there, there are different experiences that people have with the police, right? And the trust and, and uh, distrust that people have comes from a very rational place. Um, any thoughts on that? So I guess I'll dive in um, and just, I mean, I think one of the questions we're kind of watching, right, is to what extent is that stark racial divide uh, on police experiences trans changing, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of my mentors, uh, the historian Lawrence Goodwin, talked about social movements as learning laboratories, as mm -hmm. places in which people bring with them their received wisdom of how this society is supposed to work. And then they, as they engage these issues, learn how it really works, right? Um, uh, and I think there's elements of that going on here, right? So that, you know, the, and here, uh, thinking about Eduardo Bonilla Silva's work on colorblind racism, right? On the idea that the society is supposed to be colorblind. Um, and his work talks about the ways in which whites then interpret inequality through the lens of cultural deficit, right? They essentially look and explain inequality because something must be wrong with those people, with that community, because it's a colorblind society. Um, I think that there's a lot, there's been, there's, there's evidence, right, that, that, and this may be generational in part, but not entirely, and it's also about our president, right, and the, <laughs> kind of learning about that, that, you know, that the, the, the racial infrastructure of our society is being exposed to larger, you know, to people who don't have direct experience with it, right, to put it that way. And there is a rethinking about that, at least among some, on some portion of the population. And the polling data suggests this, um, you know, but one, you know, one shouldn't be too confident of about it either, right? Um, there have been other moments in which there seemed to be broad support for racial change in the majority population. Um, whether that pans out is, I think, one of the really, really big questions. Um, so there's lots of claims about young people, young whites being different on race from their experiences. There's lots of claims about, at least within, you know, Democratic voters having shifted as a result of a reaction um, in part to Trump, but also in terms of Black Lives Matter and, and all those kinds of things. The question, those, those claims will be tested, right? That's the question. And how that plays out, um, you know, one of the things we certainly know about the civil rights history, right, is that lots of support outside the South among whites for racial change in the South. But don't bring that stuff to our, to my neighborhood, right? Don't don't bring that to my workplace. Um, certainly don't, you know, let my children cross racial date, right? Those kinds of things. And so that 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 also is our history. And so you know, again, when these things come home. Do they change? You know, if universities change admissions policies, if um, um, you know, if reparations is on the table. I mean, there's lots of lots of ifs we could imagine, right? If if we're really talking about fundamental shifts in the ways in which uh, uh, municipal budgets or or state budgets are oriented around policing and the carceral state, if those real changes happen, they move from the from the slogans to the, to the policy. What's the reaction going to be? And I think these are I think these are open questions. I actually want to complicate the question a bit because I think when we say whites have a different experience of the police, I think we're assuming a white middle class positionality, right? So if we think about whites that have a lower class background, 
um, especially in particular regions of America. Um, their experience of the police is actually quite similar to black experience, right? And it's one of the things, it's the most baffling um, because these same people who know about police violence will still present such anger and rejection of Black Lives Matter, right? Um, and so it's one of the things I actually want to think about a bit further, to complicate a bit further. Like, how is it that a group that really, in terms of socioeconomic standing, is forced into um, a similar positionality to Blacks, right? And so uh, there's a wonderful uh, book on this. Um, it's One of its chapters is called White Trash, right? And it talks about the ways in which lower income whites are actually racialized in this society. And yet the myth of race is such that they've been told your whiteness is the only privilege you have to hold on to. Even though your experience of police violence, of uh, structural violence is very similar to the black person right next to you, right? Um, but it's having to get past those blinders. And this again is why um, I tend to focus on representation, right? Because these same people, I mean, we have to acknowledge the extent to which we really live in a highly segregated society still, right? Um, and so many of us, won't have many experiences with a diverse population. I don't just mean, you know, you run across someone on the street. I mean, to know people of diverse backgrounds and to see that across your supposed racial difference, you're actually suffering from the same nonsense. You're in the same position, right? But instead, because we don't have access to that level of diversity, we rely on what we're being told on CNN, on Fox News, what's coming out the president's mouth. And this again is why it's important to keep in mind the other narratives we're getting because when we say, when we hear Trump say, for instance, that the Mexicans are gonna be a migrant horde coming to rape and pillage our women, we can say, you know, that sounds like the plot to Dracula. I don't think they're gonna do that. Actually, I think they're probably in a similar position to me, right? Um, and as an impoverished white American, you can say, yeah, that's some nonsense. I am angry at how the police violate my rights and thus the rights of black people. We should be joined in reforming the police, right? Um, and so I just wanted to think about the ways in which that question actually is a bit more complex because sure. I don't think all white Americans have the same experience of the cops. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I completely agree with that. And so that was a brief, brief synopsis uh, of their work. So I, I appreciate you complicating that. And of course, we also think about, you know, along geographical and party lines, um, the experiences are different. Um, and I, I have a question here from Facebook for Dr. Wesso, um, and I'll broaden it a little bit more. Um, so the question basically gets at costly protesting, right? And so this work that I mentioned earlier, um, interestingly, when it comes to low income resource groups, um, my, my friend Legina Goss um, finds that legislators pay more attention to them because they're expressing such intense and strong opinions because their participation is so costly. So from, for, from more low resource groups, um, their forms of participation in protests uh, signify more, right? Because they're putting more on the line, whether it's, you know, they, they're on more on an hourly based system or they have deportation, right, at the, at the risk. Or in the case of, you know, Black Lives Matter, more re most recently people are risking themselves, right, with regards to the pandemic and the reaction from the police being so violent. So as you think about costly protests, um, do you find that uh, the threat of deportation can uh, have a chilling effect or is it a mobilizing force um, as people express their support um, for immigration reform? Yeah, you know, I think it's, it depends on the individual. Um, those who are active, you know, in, in the temporary protective status uh, movement have shared that no tienen otra. They, uh, <laughs> I just did these interviews in Spanish, so I just have their, uh, words in my mind they they don't have another choice but to protest but to be out there and demand um that you know that the senate at, the, at this moment in which they're waiting for the senate to pass the hr6 uh american dream and uh i don't remember the rest of the name 
uh, but this bill that essentially will allow them to have a path to citizenship. They understand the, the, the dangers of going out, but they also feel that, you know, as, as uh, Matthew said earlier with the undocumented um, community, that they are getting out of the shadows, right? I mean, they have, they, TPS community has a little more privilege than, than undocumented community for the simple fact that they have TPS. Um, but there is, there is still a sense of, of danger in going out if TPS is, is, is an end, right? But they feel, and they have this hope that it will, that they will win, right? Whether it's an extension for a short term and then they can continue working on this path to citizenship or, or something else. They feel that it's their job um, and their responsibility their commitment to go out and 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 demand uh, a space here and you know, demand their 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 residency, but at the same time there are people um, there are other TPS holders who do have that fear um, and don't necessarily participate in protests, but they might you know or I should say don't don't participate in these mass mobilizations right being very public, but they do. Um, they do so in smaller community, in, in smaller uh, committees at home, and so it 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 really is. I think part depending on one's experience. So some of those um, people who don't feel comfortable going out and protesting in in public have experiences, you know, being persecuted um, during uh, civil unrest in their country. And so they carry, some of them carry that trauma with them and, and don't want to continue that here, right? Try to avoid any kind of um, public protest or mobilization. But in their own way, they still um, protest, right? Whether it's just sharing that message um, with others, um, or, or, or talking with their family. So I think that, that the, the threats are very, are, are known, right? The TPS Community Alliance knows um, that is very, it's, it's right there, it's in their face, yeah. um, but they feel that it's necessary. It's necessary for them to do it because um, if they don't, then who will? Right. Um, one of their main slogan for a lot of their their campaigns is "Nada sobre nosotros sin nosotros," nothing without uh, nothing about us without us. And so they know that their participation as TPS holders, they, they should be at the forefront. Um, and so they will risk. Um, they they yeah they will risk it to to fight for what should be theirs. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, there are still more Facebook questions, but we are running out of time. So I was gonna see if um, any of you had some last thoughts that you wanted to share. I think that we've gone through right, quite a bit in this conversation, um, thinking about kind of histories of protests, the way that it accumulates, different types of tactics, um, I think what's going to stay with me is thinking about normalizing injustice, mm -hmm. but also thinking about how kind of protest becomes the practice of change, right? It's not just getting out into the streets, but everyday ways of enacting kind of small acts of protest um, in our everyday experiences. Um, and then, of course, think about narratives and scripts, right? How, you know, we're living now where we accept certain scripts and certain ideas, but events can change those things, right? And these uprisings this past spring and summer have really shifted the script and shifted the narrative. One question is how long that will last, right? So I would love to talk more with Matthew about what he thinks. Um, maybe we'll have to do that some other time, right? In terms of how long you think this will last. Um, you said in your earlier comments that you think that um, it, it may lead to impacting change, which would be amazing. Um, and I'd love to think about, you know, some of both of what um, Crystal and Maisha were talking about in terms of, again, how performance, also culture, um, how that can lead to change in different ways, or it can hinder change, right? 
And then thinking too about the immigrant movement and how that's also linked up to what's happening today. These things aren't happening in isolation. Um, so I have so much that I'm thinking about and I have more questions um, now than I did before, but it's, this is why we're doing this. This, this is great. So, you know, we wanted to give each of you a chance just to say anything in closing or any last thoughts that you had and same with you, Vanessa, if you have any last thoughts as well. So who wants to start? With I the can last start thought? giving you just <laughs> as me, you know, I'll just say this. I, th I think one of the things that I, I've been thinking about, and I don't know that I have answers to this yet, is uh, um, in terms of Black Lives Matter, is the you know is the kind of is this question of rhythms and 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 um, um, rise and fall in that sense. And I, and I don't I don't mean fall in the sense of collapse, but rather just the level of activity. Um, you know, I think in many ways it's not surprising that. Um, you know, with the with the Trump Trump presidency, the very political terrain that Black Lives Matter had emerged out of in response to the first black president, that the la the, the the you know the ways in which so much of the um, particularly when it came to policing, the sort of uh, locally based uh, in, in structural racist systems maintained right was the context in which Black Lives Matter emerges from. When you get then, uh, you know, a white nationalist president, with for whom there isn't that sense of how do you how do you position yourselves relative to that to get actual change happen? It's not surprising that there's a kind of taking stock and a pulling back and a rethinking of things, right? What's surprising in some ways, or certainly what surprised me, right, is the current moment of uprising. Um, um, but I think what it suggests, right, is that 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 relative quiet wasn't a retreat in the sense of a disappearance of a movement, but rather a, a period of having to re reorganize and rethink how. Um, uh, and so what's quite exciting, right, is that not just that Black Lives Matter has a kind of currency that it can, it reemerges when it's, you know, in response to events that's so, and, and, and at much, you know, larger levels at a national level that we've not ever seen before. Um, but I think that suggests also a kind of staying power, um, a kind of um, um, uh, a, a, at least a potential to have the kind of creative in, uh, engagement with the political process that can allow that movement to really push for the kinds of changes um, um, to funding the police, et cetera, that would really remake not just policing, but but so much of the way race operates in local communities. The potential to do that, not by any means the guarantee. But I'll stop there. Actually, if I might build off of something you said, um, Matthew, um, I, we were talking about that moment of quiet being a moment of meditation on uh, not just the why, but also the how, right? And one of the things I'm really interested in thinking about, what keeps me kind of hopeful um, are the ways in which uh, modern protesters are innovating the way we protest with technology. Um, so for instance, in thinking about how it was that the civil rights era had any success at all, um, even as Reagan undid a lot of that. Um, but in thinking about why they had some success, part of that has to do with tech, right? Um, that you now had this new era of global television in which the assaults on protesters was being broadcast across the world and, and in which um, Soviets were watching this and saying, really, you want the U.S. to be a global leader? <laughs> in other words, the technology was used to embarrass us, right? Unfortunately, we're at a point where I think we're way past just being embarrassed. However, the technological, that we're still innovating with technology, right? I mean, so what I'm seeing is not just the ways in which protesters are using technology to really allow others access to a kind of black interiority, intellect, pain. In other words, to talk about the actual experience of being black and not just the fiction, um, but also how it's illustrating a profound era of coalition that's global, right? Um, so for instance, we can talk about the ways in which teams across the U.S. Um, 
shut down one of Trump's rallies by buying out all the tickets. I love that so much, right? And because it's also showing us the ways in which we can protest with joy, right? Because to do this just out of anger and frustration, you burn out quick. There has to be some hope, some joy there as well, right? But what's also amazing is thinking about, for instance, the K-pop fans that have been shutting down servers where racist comments appear, right? Um, that we now have a multitude of forms to engage in the demand for social injustice. And more importantly, we're seeing this being echoed and engaged in around the world. And so that's what's giving me hope, really, right? In terms of thinking about how long this will last. Yeah, there will be quiet periods, but we're just innovating, as you said, Matthew. I want to I wanna say something actually related um, to what you just brought up, Maisha. Um, something that also, you know, if we want to say gives, gives me hope in with this particular uh, movement that I've, that I've been talking about, National TPS, is the focus on, on the youth, right? And, and, and youth being able to, to do different things that, that um, <laughs> we, well, I don't know, oh, whatever, uh, <laughs> that uh, wasn't imagined before, right? Using social media. Um, in the particular case with this movement, you know, there was, uh, they call themselves TPS youth, and it's either because they are young and have TPS or they are US citizens, but children of TPS holders. And a group of them, because of their, their, their US citizenship, they were able to actually go to Rome um, just two years ago, um, during the canonization of Monsignor Romero, who was a Salvadoran priest who was murdered um, for speaking out against uh, violence during the Civil War, and, and it, they canonized him, and, and they went to talk to, pope Fran to the Pope, to Pope Francis, give him actually the shirt, a TPS shirt, and say, hey, we know you can't, you don't have a whole lot of power in American politics, but we want you to have this, we want you to say something because this is important for us and it should be important for you because uh, you know, our rights as human rights, it's, it's, we want you to speak, right? And it really did, it, 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 I mean, obviously he didn't, the Pope couldn't do much, but it did revitalize that or encourage other people to, to, to participate um, and to join and really the youth, it, I'm very hopeful for this TPS youth because they are leaders, right? They're becoming leaders. They didn't know about TPS. Many of them didn't know about TPS before 2017 uh, when Trump decided, uh, announced that he was going to end it, right? A lot of them were, didn't speak up about anything, um, but until it hit home, until it realized that it would affect um, them and those they loved, they became um, became organizers, right? A lot of them have. And, and one more thing, and actually it's still related to youth, but it's more about this coalition building. Um, you know, that, that last caravan was supposed to happen on June 10th, um, but they rescheduled it because of the mass uh, mobilization protests, right? Because of uh, the murder of George Floyd. And they realized that they, uh, the, the, the system, right, the system that, that murdered George Floyd is the same system that is putting the children, you know, Central American kids in cages, that's keeping them in cages, right? That is, that is ending um, the TPS and that try to end up and all these other uh, immigrant, um, uh, you know, uh, programs and stuff. And so, on top of that, there, there, there has to be a constant conversation within this, organ, within this movement, within the TPS movement, because there are black TPS holders, right? And so there is a constant conversation and making sure that, that they're supporting not only the immigrant movement, but also Black Lives Matter movement. And I think that that, of course, it's not perfect. There are still, uh, a, you know, some some Latinx uh, individuals and communities that that need to to understand more, right, and and kind of let go of a lot of racist um, rhetoric that that people were were brought up with. But it is still um, 
a desire to build coalition, right? And I think that that is one of the most important things when it comes um, to social change, to have that connection, to have these coalitions exist. Mm -hmm. Crystal, do you want to have the last word? Sure. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that I'll just close by reiterating what I shared earlier, which is that if the definition of protest is mass gathering and this current moment that feels like everything is coalescing with urgency and activity, then yes, it's going to end, right? That is not going to be sustained indefinitely, in my opinion, right? Um, even if you think of some of the longest protests, like the, the bus boycott that lasted, I think, for longer than a year, Ultimately, those kinds of things, if, if our thinking is that, right, that protest looks like that and functions like that, that's going to end. But if we have a broader frame of protest um, as practice, as everyday performance, then it doesn't stop. And it really hasn't stopped since, you know, the, the beginning of people in this uh, country besides the Native Americans, right? So that, that there has always been everyday acts of protest and resistance um, from Native people to enslaved Africans um, during enslavement. I mean, this was a part of the way that people survived, protest and assertion and everyday acts of resistance and constantly trying to move the needle, change the story, share stories, and ultimately change the narrative, which ultimately changes culture, which ultimately <laughs> changes the way that our, our nation is run. Like all of those things, um, you know, uh, have just always been happening. It, it, hasn't, it hasn't stopped. So I just feel like it's also important to, to honor that and to really see the opportunity to promote that as, you know, like this, um, you know, a, 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 a standard understanding of what, what, what protest looks like every day, what, what a lifetime of protest looks like, you know, are all of these, these types of things. And then also the other thing is just that protest, as I, as I shared in my remarks, is not just the anti, it's the pro, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not just the um, understanding colorblindness, but it's understanding that we have to assert being color brave or color conscious. You know, um, Melody Hobson has a great TED talk about being color brave in the arts world, especially in theater and film and television, we talk a lot about color conscious casting, right? Um, and what that means to not cast in a colorblind way, right? But to cast in a, in a color conscious way so that it, the ultimate act of protest is change and is leading to transformation. So I can just close with that, you know, protest every day, nonstop, turn your practice into a practice of change, um, into a practice of proposition, um, and promotion and transformation. And if I could just um, piggyback on that, I uh, love it. I tell my students this at the start and then at the end of my class. Um, this is a quote by Alex Steffen. He's an environmental activist. Um, and uh, Alex Steffen writes, optimism is a political act. Those who benefit from the status quo are perfectly happy for us to think nothing is going to get any better. And in fact, in fact, these days, cynicism is obedience. Um, so keep the pressure on, um, call your legislators, turn out to vote in November, um, and write and sign petitions and every day, right, live with the sense of things are going to change, right? Um, keep, maintain that optimism. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, and thank you to all of our viewers tonight. Um, we'll hopefully see you next week. Um, we're going to talk about media and technology, um, social media, some really cool stuff. So we hope to see you then. Uh, but thanks, everyone, and good night. <laughs>